Defense News is proudly sponsored by Navy Federal Credit Union. If you're a member of our nation's armed forces, the Department of Defense, or if your family is, we'd be proud to serve you too. On this episode of Defense News Weekly, we get an update on the National Guard's mission in the Capitol following recent unrest. We look at the Pentagon's plan to speed up counter drone efforts and a contract to deliver more underwater mine destroyers. Plus, we'll pause to remember the 30th anniversary of the Gulf War and gather Military Times editors to break down this week's top stories. With the latest news and analysis from the Pentagon to the platoon, this is Defense News Weekly. Welcome back to Defense News Weekly. I'm Andrea Scott. We've got a full show for you this week, starting with an update from the Capitol. On January 6th, a violent mob stormed the Capitol grounds during a joint session of Congress. One police officer and one protester were killed in the attack, and several others died in the riot as large areas of the building were damaged. With continued threats being tracked during the remainder of President Donald Trump's term, the National Guard has taken on an increased posture in cities around the country. Reporting from Capitol Hill, Philip Bathey has more. In the days leading up to the inauguration of President-elect Joe Biden, the National Guard has descended onto Washington, D.C., fortifying Capitol Hill. As you can see behind me, still fences and concrete barriers have been put up in the hopes of preventing a second storming of the Capitol by supporters of President Donald Trump. Since the January 6th riot, the entire DC National Guard has been activated in defense of the Capitol. As many as 20,000 members of the National Guard from DC and neighboring states have deployed to the Capitol to provide security in case a second attempt to violently overturn the election takes place. DC will soon see more than double the amount of U.S. service members defending its streets than are currently deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan combined. The FBI has warned of armed protests taking place in DC and in all 50 state capitals in the nation starting January 17th and lasting through the January 20th inauguration of President-elect Biden. The members of the National Guard directly defending the Capitol will be issued rifles and wear their body armor, Department of Defense officials said. As of now, members of the Guard in DC but not on post of the Capitol building will not be armed while on post, but their weapons will be nearby. Colorado Representative Jason Crow, an Army veteran of the 75th Ranger Regiment, has asked Army Secretary Ryan McCarthy to conduct a review of the troops deployed to DC to ensure none are sympathetic to domestic terrorists. Though President-elect Joe Biden's inauguration is only days away, it is possible the National Guard could still be on duty in DC for weeks. So as of January 6th, the Army Secretary has authorized uh, National Guard troops to be in D.C. for 30 days from that date. Um, so that will include a couple of weeks after the inauguration to see if there are any aftershocks um, after the event. And their mission is largely uh, support to law enforcement, which basically just kind of means presence. It means walking around, being there to help out if anybody needs help. So while all this preparation is going on for the inauguration, of course, the Justice Department, the FBI are doing investigations against uh, the people who were involved in the riot, the people who breached the Capitol and damaged property or stole property while they were there. Agents and our partners are on the streets investigating leads not only here in the D.C. area, but also across the country through the FBI's 56 field offices. There's been some anecdotes about some active duty or retired service members having been involved in, at least in the protest outside, um, but up to and including the rioting inside. And so the FBI will have the lead on that. However, um, if there are service members that, uh, you know, their commands become aware that they were, they were there, the services can launch their own investigations into them. Uh, but as far as any federal criminal charges right now, that's all in the FBI's purview. 
It's a little sticky because the Justice Department does have the lead and generally the military services will um, defer any federal criminal investigation to the FBI. However, if uh, the FBI doesn't find anything that meets sort of their threshold, it is possible that the services uh, can do their own prosecution based on um, you know, conduct unbecoming allegations or sedition allegations, things in UCMJ that are uh, punishable. And there's also the remote chance that uh, service members who are retired but are still um, in a reserve status technically could be recalled to active duty to face charges. That is one of the questions around uh, a retired Air Force Lieutenant Colonel who was photographed on the floor of the house. Um, and so that's a possibility. It's not something that happens very often, but that will be um, up to his chain of command, as it were, up to the Air Force to decide whether they want to pursue that. There have also been a lot of questions about the National Guard's role last on, on January 6th, uh, where they were, why it took so long for more Guard to be able to come to the Capitol to help with clearing the building. And really the answer to that is a lot of bureaucracy. D.C., um, because it's not a state, the, the mayor of D.C. doesn't have the authority to activate D.C.'s National Guard. She routes that request um, through the Army Secretary up through the Secretary of Defense. And uh, she had requested that for the Metropolitan Police on January 6th, but the Capitol Police, which is a separate federal organization, had not requested uh, National Guard presence on January 6th. And so after the Capitol had been breached, that's when they called. And so it's highly likely based on the amount of explaining that the Army and the Pentagon have had to do about this, how all of this works, where the chain of command is here, um, an outcry from lawmakers that there may be some changes uh, to the way that these requests are made uh, and the way that intelligence is shared, um, who has decision-making power to kind of expedite that National Guard response in the future. As you can see here, the National Guard is out with steel fences and concrete barriers in preparation for potential future violence. We'll be covering it all at Military Times. From Capitol Hill, this is Phil Bathey. Thanks, Philip. And in other headlines this week, as part of his upcoming inauguration, President-elect Joe Biden will visit Arlington National Cemetery. The visit on January 20th will be one of Biden's first official acts as president and is intended as tribute toward fallen troops. Finally, this week marks the 30-year anniversary of the launch of Operation Desert Storm. In January 1991, then-President George H.W. Bush announced the start of the campaign which began with a massive air offensive and following ground invasion by U.S. and Allied forces. The Gulf War was launched to expel Iraqi troops from Kuwait following an invasion led by Iraqi leader Saddam Hussein. That's it for your military headlines for this week. When we come back, we'll learn about a new Pentagon directive to speed up counter drone efforts. And later in the show, we have a roundtable of reporters and editors with a look at this week's top stories. Congress has directed the Pentagon to start speeding up its process for countering drones and is adding more than $47 million to fuel the effort. And that's both big and small drones, according to the 2021 National Defense Authorization Act. To discuss this in this edition of Actionable Intelligence is Defense News Ground Warfare reporter Jen Judson. Jen, where is the United States right now in anti-drone technology? Uh, so the U.S. has spent many years uh, proliferating these capabilities to go after threats, particularly in the Middle East. But we've also seen them in the high end uh, side, you know, against Russia, uh, particularly Russia has used drones um, in a hybrid way that has caused the U.S. to rethink uh, what we are developing in terms of our weapon systems on the high end. Uh, the Army is just wrapping up developing an interim short-range air defense system to go after larger drones. Uh, and there's also a capability within the Army that's being developed, the indirect fire protection capability, that will also go after counter UAS, uh, particularly using high-powered microwave technology, directed energy technology. Directed energy technology is supposed to go on to strikers for short-range air defense and counter UAS capability. But then on the smaller side, um, there's been a lot of systems procured, particularly for the Middle East, to get after these rogue threats, these little drones cropping up all over the place. Um, 
and every service basically developed their own systems and threw them out there uh, in response to urgent operational requests from the region. Uh, so the Pentagon took a look at their inventory and they had maybe over 40 systems that they were working with. Um, so that's, that's basically where the U.S. is in terms of their counter drone capability. Uh, so there is definitely a need to, to sort of streamline that now. And we're talking big drones and small consumer drones as well, right? Yes, all the way from little drones that you can buy at a CVS, a small drugstore on Amazon, you know, all the way up to the higher end drones. Congress recently made a direction toward, towards the Pentagon, asking them to, to in, fa in, in a way, just simplify what they have and, and be more effective. Can you tell us a little, a little bit about that request? Yeah, so actually, um, in November 2019, the Pentagon decided to set up a counter small UAS office um, that was basically to address the problem of having too many drones uh, out there, I mean, counter drone systems out there. And uh, so they actually gave the Army control over that office. It's a joint office, but it's, it's run by an Army general. Uh, and they whittled down the, those 40 systems to eight uh, that address fixed, semi-fixed sites, as well as mobile capability uh, and dismounted capability to get after uh, group one and two small UAS, uh, counter small UAS capability. Uh, they want to develop an enduring system. You know, the idea is to get a system that's technologically capable now of going after groups um, one through three, that's all under small UAS capability, um, that has the ability to roll new technology and later um, as things develop, as things progress, because threats are, are also progressing. Swarming capability is getting better. Um, the ability to evade sensors is getting better. Um, so the pace of technology on both sides is moving very rapidly. So uh, there's really no silver bullet. Um, so an enduring system will be a challenge. A swarm of drones coming into one place, that's essentially like a whole different weapon uh, at that point, isn't it? Yes, and, and that's why there's a big focus on the development of something like a high power microwave capability that would be able to just sort of zap all of them at once. Um, it's too hard to laze like, you know, 10 or 20 swarming drones using directed energy or using some kind of interceptor or a net or whatever you want to use. Um, so high power microwave would probably be pretty key to taking those out. For high-powered microwave testing, uh, it's actually being run through uh, the Air Force, but the Army is uh, a partner in that um, in that testing, and that will be going on over the next year, um, and as well as into future years. But they really are ramping that up. Um, the Army is specifically focused on that through their Rapid uh, Capabilities Office, uh, that is focused on directed energy and, and high-power microwave capability, uh, and that will actually be once that capability is developed, will be embedded in the indirect fire protection capability. Jen, thank you so much. Thank you. And now, our headlines. Swedish vendor Saab has announced that it received a contract to deliver underwater vehicles to a British-French program. The vehicles will blow up mines. The deal, valued at $36 million, is for Saab's multi-shot mine neutralization system, comprised of a remote-controlled vehicle capable of inspecting mines and sticking explosives to them. The robots can carry three charges at a time. The company expects to deliver the first vehicles to Francis Tallis, which manages the binational program as a main contractor in 2022. The Department of Defense must determine the national security threat posed by quantum computing as part of the new annual defense policy law. The 2021 National Defense Authorization Act, which became law New Year's Day after the Senate overrode President Trump's veto, contained a provision that directed the department to deliver, to deliver a report to Congress that provides, quote, comprehensive assessment of the current and potential threats and risks posed by quantum computing technologies to critical national security systems. Powerful quantum computers pose a danger to national security because they may be able to break current encryption capabilities, meaning secure communications under current systems will be nearly impossible. On the flip side, adversaries with quantum capabilities will be able to communicate securely without the fear of interception by the United States. That's unless the United States achieves its own quantum computer. That's it for the news from the defense beat. When we come back, we'll hear from Navy Federal Credit Union personal finance expert, Jeanette Mack, with her tips on how to safely navigate mobile cash apps.
On this edition of Money Minute, Navy Federal Credit Union personal finance expert Jeanette Mack talks about the do's and don'ts of sending cash through mobile apps. When you're out and splitting the bill with friends, if you're like millions of other people, you're using a person-to-person -person payment app like Zelle. It's fast, easy, and a great way to keep track of your cash spending. Keep in mind, though, when it comes to fraud or sending money to someone you don't know by mistake, correcting the situation is not so easy. For instance, when you lose your debit or credit card, you can freeze transactions until you find it again. Or your bank or credit union can issue you a new one, sometimes instantly. And if fraud happens, you're usually covered by a zero liability policy that helps get your money back. But with a peer-to-peer -peer app, like gift cards, cash, and personal checks, you're not covered. That's because they're authorized transactions that you requested and are not considered fraudulent, even if you made a mistake. So it's important that you know who you're sending cash to. Verify their email or home address or phone number before you send it. The convenience of apps and payment cards are a plus for your financial life, and your vigilance will help make sure your hard-earned money goes where you want it to go. Thanks, Jeanette. We'll see you next time. To get more of our coverage, be sure to visit our websites at Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps Times.com and DefenseNews.com. For our curated top stories in your inbox every day, subscribe to our Early Bird Brief. And to keep up to date with all of our coverage, be sure to visit our Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube pages. And when we come back, we'll break down this week's top stories with analysis from our Military Times editorial team. Welcome back. It's been a big week in military news. So here to provide insight behind the headlines is the Military Times editorial team with this week's Reporters Roundtable. Welcome back to the Military Times Reporters Roundtable, where each week we bring you the insights to the biggest headlines to the military community. I'm Leo Shane, Capitol Hill Bureau Chief. We've got a new inauguration next week, a new president coming in, but we're still reeling with the aftermath of the Capitol Hill attacks that happened on January 6th. With me to break down some of the details of that are Megan Myers, our Pentagon Bureau Chief, Howard Altman, our Managing Editor, and Andrew Tillman, our Executive Editor. Welcome to each of you. Thanks for joining us virtually. Megan, there's still a lot of things we don't know about what happened on the 6th, exactly where the protesters got in, how what aid they might have had. But one of the biggest stories that's still floating around is this issue of the guard and the guard response, why it was delayed. Can you give some insight into what happened there? Yeah, I think the best explanation is bureaucracy, honestly. Uh, DC is not a state, and so if the mayor wants backup or if a federal agency would like backup from the National Guard, um, they have to go through the Army Secretary who has to get it finally approved by the Secretary of Defense. Um, and that took a few hours uh, on January 6th, and then it also took a co another couple of hours to call up those guardsmen, get them over to DC's armory, put them on buses and send them over to the Capitol where eventually they were able to kind of form a perimeter around the uh, federal authorities who were already there uh, to keep any further protesters from kind of encroaching on the Capitol while they were trying to close it. Howard, I know one of the issues that we've been tracking is the involvement of veterans and the possible involvement of some troops. Right now we don't have any uh, hard information on troops that may have been involved in the actual violence at the Capitol. But we do know that members of the military were in the crowd. We know that quite a few veterans were there. What is what is the Pentagon's response to that? How are they dealing with this issue of, you know, some extremism in the military? Well, this is rather chilling. The Army is going to be seeing who it should be investigating among those National Guard troops coming to Washington, D.C., for security reasons. So they're going to be taking a look at all the folks who are coming, all the troops are coming, and seeing which ones should be further investigated for security issues. It's not unprecedented back in June during the Black Lives Matter protests, an Ohio National Guardsman was sent back to Ohio from D.C. because the FBI found white supremacist information on his social media account. So they're looking to see um, if there's any dangerous uh, troops coming to, coming to D.C. Andrew, Howard brought up the issue of the uh, of protests back in June and the Guard involvement then. We, we saw Joint Chief Chairman Mark, Mark Milley get into some hot water about his stuff. You've talked in the past uh, on this show and on other shows about the, the Guard and, the, and the, Pen the Pentagon at large wanting to stay out of politics, wanting to be seen as nonpartisan. 
what does what does this do when you've got such a, a partisan event, such a, a violent event, and now the guard being brought in to provide this? Where where does this leave the Pentagon? Uh, yeah, I think that's a really big concern on the mind of General Mark Milley specifically, and the rest of the Pentagon leadership. You know, uh, this summer when um, General Milley was drawn into a photo op with the president uh, in Lafayette Square, surrounded by the Black Lives Matter protesters. Um, he, he ended up just days later really apologizing for that and indicating that he felt like it wasn't appropriate. It was widely believed that he had, um, you know, appeared as though the military was um, taking a political position on the matter. And I think that's really looming large in all of these discussions. I think the last thing that the military wants to see is um, its position as an apolitical, independent institution uh, jeopardized. And um, I think that uh, the last thing they want is to be seen as the president's praetorian guard of, of, of sorts. And I, I think that as, as bad and horrific as the uh, events of January 6th were, you know, one thing that we didn't see was some kind of um, confrontation between protesters and military troops in a, a Tiananmen Square style photo op where, um, which could have a uh, inspired some sympathy for the um, insurrectionists, or um, inspired some some anger and frustration or concern about the military's independence. And you know we didn't see that. So although the military is getting some criticism for maybe not having responded as promptly as some would like, um, you know there it is worth noting that we did not end up with the other problem, which is uh, seeming as though the military is is getting too involved in this. On the flip side, though, one of the concerns is that, uh, you know, the Guard may have not been properly deployed. There may not have been the awareness ahead of time because folks were worried about those kind of photo ops. Right. So I know these issues came up at a, uh, at a um, Senate hearing uh, last week um, dealing with the possible confirmation of Lloyd Austin as the next Secretary of Defense. Uh, Megan, these are issues that he's going to have to deal with when he comes uh, into power. It's assumed that he'll be confirmed, although there's still some, some things. He's going to be on the Hill next week. What what is he what what issues do you expect to come up for him right away when he takes over in the Pentagon? Well, the number one thing, the number one thing he's going to get questions about is uh, his military career, which spans decades and is the bulk of his experience as an adult uh, and as a professional. And that is a little bit at odds with the way that a lot of people see the role of the Secretary of Defense as this a civilian controlled organization. And although Lloyd Austin is a civilian now, um, that's only been a few years compared to decades of him uh, serving in uniform. So the number, while, while questions about January 6th and DOD's role and what DOD's role maybe should be um, in something like this going forward, the number one question will be about whether he is the right person given his uh, narrow experience um, in the defense world, whether he's the right person to be the Secretary of Defense. Yeah, and that waiver issue is going to take up a lot of the rest of the month, legislative-wise, uh, just figuring out how to get him in there and whether or not Democrats can get that through quickly. Howard, right before we go, what else does Austin have to worry about in the longer term here? I know there's a couple of issues. Well, there's still a yeah, very dangerous world out there. He's going to have to um, re-examine the drawdown or withdrawal of troops in Afghanistan and Iraq, have to deal with uh, potential threats from Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, the, the South China Sea remains very dangerous. The, the issue of Taiwan um, is, a, is a big issue, what the Chinese do there. Um, Russians in Ukraine and elsewhere, Middle East continues to be a, um, a, a very dangerous uh, area. What's, gonna, what's Iran going to do? So he's got a lot on his plate. Plus, he's going to have to deal with whatever is discovered about the uh, level of uh, white supremacists or insurrectionists within the ranks. So he's going to have his uh, plate very full. Well, we'll be watching those hearings very closely, and we'll be watching the inauguration very closely, and we'll bring you all the headlines from that and anything else relevant in the military community. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next week. And that's all we have time for this week. Please visit us on militarytimes.com and defensenews.com for more coverage. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next week.